on World News Tonight. Bakhmut had fallen. Russia's Wagner Group declares total control of Ukrainian stronghold of Bakhmut. Increasing ties. Yoon and Scholz to join hands on tech industries while meeting in the ongoing G7 summit. Spreading blazes. Firefighters extinguish blaze at historical post office in Manila. How much damage has been done? Find out tonight. On to victory. Team Malaysia races to win in port as Ocean Race Leg 5 gets underway. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and you are watching World News this Monday night where we bring to you the latest updates from around the world. During the weekend, Russian Wagner Group declared victory over Bakhmut. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky compared the damage in Bakhmut to the destruction brought on to Hiroshima after it was hit by an atomic bomb as he denied Russia had captured the frontline city. Volodymyr Zelensky on Sunday likened the destruction of Hiroshima during World War II to the devastation seen in Ukraine's Bakhmut. On Saturday, Russia claimed to have captured the eastern city, which has been the focus of the longest and bloodiest battle of the conflict. Zelensky, in Japan for the G7 summit, denied this. They are in Bakhmut today. Where exactly, I'm not going to tell you. But this means that Bakhmut has not been conquered by the Russian Federation today. There can be no other interpretation. In Hiroshima, the Ukrainian president laid flowers at the cenotaph to victims of the world's first atomic bombing of a city. Photographs of the aftermath reminded him of Bakhmut and other destroyed Ukrainian cities, Zelensky said. He had earlier, alongside US President Joe Biden, lamented the tragedy that had unfolded. For today, Bakhmut is only in our hearts. There is nothing on this place. So, just ground and, and a lot of dead Russians. During that meeting, Biden announced a $375 million package of military aid, including artillery and armored vehicles for Ukraine. He told Zelensky the United States was doing all it could to strengthen Ukraine's defense against Russia. Together with the entire G7, uh, we have Ukraine's back and I promise we're not going anywhere. Russian President Vladimir Putin has hailed what he says was a victory for his forces in Bakhmut, describing it as a liberation in a statement on the Kremlin's website. And wrapping up his trip to Hiroshima, U.S. President Joe Biden noted a shift in ties with Beijing will come shortly. The American leader also pointed out Ukraine will not use F-16 fighter jets to move into the Russian territory. After the three-day G7 summit in Hiroshima, U.S. President Joe Biden held a press conference on Sunday to discuss key issues discussed with other world leaders in Japan. There, Biden said the group of seven leaders had agreed to diversify supply chains to reduce dependence on China, stressing that they're not trying to decouple from Beijing. And despite U.S.-China relations being ever so frosty, especially since the diplomatic tensions caused when the U.S. shot down a Chinese balloon that flew over sensitive military sites, the U.S. leader expects relations to thaw very shortly. Still, Biden stressed that the U.S. refuses to trade certain items with China over concerns that such goods can be used to produce nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction. Meanwhile, Biden touched upon the potential use of F-16 fighter jets by Ukraine as G-7 leaders agreed to join allied training programs for Ukrainian pilots. While no discussions on the actual delivery of F-16s were mentioned, Biden said that he had received a flat assurance from Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky that any F-16s received from their Western allies will not be used to go into Russian territory. I have a flat assurance from, the, from Zelensky that they will not, they will not use it to go on and move into Russian geographic territory. But wherever Russian troops are within Ukraine in the area, they would be able to do that. Biden says it's highly unlikely the planes would be used in any Ukrainian offensives in the coming weeks, but added that Ukraine would need such weapons to continue to defend itself from Russia. 
Following the G7 summit in Hiroshima, President Yoon returned to Seoul where he headed to a bilateral summit with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz as soon as he landed. South Korea and Germany have agreed to increase supply chain cooperation in defense and high-tech areas. They're looking to establish a deal to protect military secrets to boost cooperation on defense technologies. President Yoon Seok-yeol and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz held bilateral talks since hold on Sunday, following the three-day G7 summit in Hiroshima. Speaking at a joint press conference, the two leaders stressed the importance of building economic resilience as both economies are highly dependent on exports and are facing systemic changes in global supply chains. Schultz further raised the need to reduce economic dependency on China, highlighting partnerships with countries like South Korea and Japan. We will also cooperate with South Korea, especially in the field of electric vehicle and battery production. In particular, we will strengthen cooperation with the Republic of Korea by strengthening our innovation capacity in the semiconductor sector. Notably, Yoon and Schultz agreed to quickly establish a military secret protection agreement to increase cooperation in the defense industry. South Korea and Germany rank among the world's eight largest arms exporters as of 2022. Also, as the two governments are both pursuing a carbon-neutral future, Yoon noted that Seoul decided to join the G7's climate club spearheaded by the German Chancellor. With this year marking the 140th anniversary of Korea-Germany relations and 60 years since Korean guest workers headed to Germany as nurses and minors, Schulz is the first incumbent German leader to visit Seoul since 1993. Noting how Germany had also experienced national division but unified some 33 years ago, Schulz conveyed his sympathy and support for peace on the Korean peninsula and the complete denuclearization of North Korea. Having also discussed the Russian invasion of Ukraine, both leaders expressed their solidarity with Kyiv and pledged continued support for the people of Ukraine. Emmanuel Macron made a brief but symbolic visit to Mongolia, the first by a French president to the country nestled between China and Russia that is of growing strategic interest in the West. Sandwiched between Russia and China, French President Macron sees Mongolia as a relationship worth developing. The landlocked state has not explicitly condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and Macron is out to draw the country towards the West. We naturally just mentioned Russia's war against Ukraine, the consequences of which are not limited to Europe, and I was able with Mr. President to share our determination to support an attacked state. Mongolia is also home to one of the world's most important uranium mines. And Macron was courting Mongolia's president on behalf of French company Arano, currently bidding to exploit the site. We have decided to work together to strengthen our energy sovereignty by providing critical metals for your country. In this regard, the partnership with Arano is a central part. The country's main economic partner is China, where it sends 86% of its exports. So Macron would like to cement partnerships to challenge the influence of Russia and China in the region. Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis said his Conservative Party unleashed a political earthquake with a thumping win at Sunday's election as he hinted that he would seek a new ballot to obtain an absolute majority enabling it to govern alone. Greece's ruling New Democracy Party claimed victory in the country's parliamentary election on Sunday, but fell just short of an absolute majority to form a government on its own. In Athens, Greek Prime Minister and New Democracy leader Kyriakos Mitsotakis called the vote decisive. The result was a stunning boost for Mitsotakis, who is seeking a second term and has had to contend with a wiretapping scandal, a cost of living crisis, and a deadly rail crash in February that triggered public outrage. Sunday's vote was a blow to opposition leader Alexis Tsipras, the country's former prime minister, who called the result, quote, particularly negative for his Syriza party and said he contacted Mitsotakis to congratulate him on his victory. On Monday, Greece's president will give the three main parties three days each to form a coalition government. If they all fail, the president will appoint a caretaker government to prepare new elections about a month later. We'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break.
Welcome back. A massive fire broke out at the historic Manila Center post office in the Philippine capital with teams of firefighters battling for more than seven hours through the night before it was finally brought under control. The situation was raised to the highest fire alarm level before it was brought under control about an hour later. As firefighters worked to control the flames, the fire and thick smoke could be seen blowing from the windows of a neoclassical building known for its grand entry lined with ornate columns. Natum B. Thorza director of the National Capital Region's Bureau of Fire Protection told reporters that the internal wood structure of the building was burned all the way from the basement to the third floor. The post office building sits within the historical old Manila town near other tourist landmarks along the Pasig River that flows through the capital. It was first built in 1926 and designed by Filipino architect Juan M. Aralano and Thomas Mapua and was severely damaged during World War II but rebuilt in 19. 46 preserving most of its original edifice. The building currently houses the Philippine Postal Corporation, the government-run postal service that handles everything from regular mail, parcels and special stamp collections. Authorities hope cooler temperatures and showers forecast for the coming week will help firefighters battling blazes in the oil-rich Canadian province, although storms could complicate efforts. Amid hot, dry conditions, forecasters were tracking a front likely to move into the province on Sunday that should bring much-needed relief, including humidity and even rain. Authorities have closed some parks and campaign grounds in Alberta over the Victoria Day weekend. Smoke from wildfires in Canada is moving into parts of the central U.S. and could linger in the days ahead, health and weather officials warned on Thursday. Air quality alerts have been posted as of early Friday across several states including Nebraska, Washington, Montana and Wisconsin with a special weather statement about air quality environment. Smoke from wildfires in Canada hangs over Minneapolis May 18. The heaviest smoke concentration should shift further east into the Midwest later in the day, affecting major metro areas including Chicago, Indianapolis and St. Louis. Canada has had an especially active start to the fire season. Last week, devastating wildfires in Alberta had burned more than 150 times more area in that province than in the last five years combined by the same point in the year. In eastern Nebraska's Dallas County, which includes Omaha, the health department warned soak could remain. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's air quality index indicated parts of the Rockies, the Great Plains and the Midwest, including the Nebraska Panhandle and Northeast corner of the state had very unhealthy air quality. Italy's Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni had visited her country's northeastern region after floods killed at least 14 people and displaced thousands more. Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni has visited flooded homes in northeastern Italy on Sunday after returning early from the G7 summit in Japan. Flooding has left 14 people dead while 36,000 were displaced by the incessant rain in Emilia-Romagna earlier this week. Some 10,000 have since been able to return home. Maloney told reporters that speaking to those who had lost everything was a moving experience. Volunteers are working to remove water still invading homes, while bulldozers repair a railway bridge damaged in the floods which have been described as the worst the country has seen in a century. Violent downpours transform streets in cities and towns across the northeast of Italy into rivers. The countdown has begun for South Korea's momentous third launch of its homegrown space rocket. The Nuri adding to the excitement is the private sector's very first participation in the project. South Korea's space industry is reaching new heights. With the upcoming third launch of the Nuri space rocket comes a debut of private entities being involved in space exploration. Hanwha Aerospace secured the technology transfer and project management for Nuri last year. The company will receive vital technologies from the Korea Aerospace Research Institute, enabling it to oversee the next four Nuri rocket launches, including this Wednesday's. In addition, Hanhua will invest 50 billion won or over $37 million by 2025 to establish a rocket assembly facility in Suncheon and core component manufacturing facilities in Kohung, both Cholanando province. 
Through this technology transfer, Hanwha aims to emerge as a comprehensive solution provider in the space industry. Our goal is to provide comprehensive space solutions, leveraging our launch service expertise and relationships with our sister companies. This entails building a strong space industry value chain, including satellite manufacturing, space transportation and exploration. Bring the private sector is part of a government scheme to enhance the technological reliability of the duty rocket and create a self-sustaining space industrial ecosystem. This was inspired by NASA's technology transfer to SpaceX, which has emerged as one of the world's leading aerospace companies. One expert explains that collaboration between the public and private sectors could lead to incredible innovation, but without soaring costs. SpaceX's Falcon 9 is capable of deploying a 23-ton payload in a single launch, enabling cost-effective satellite deployment. Moreover, its highly advanced reusable rocket engines further drive cost reduction. However, the expert expressed doubts about Korea's potential to outperform other countries given its relatively late start in the field. Duri is an impressive feat considering South Korea's late entry into space technology. However, looking to the current blueprint, South Korea may face challenges in developing reusable engines in the near future, a technology that has already been mastered by SpaceX. This makes it unlikely for Korea to gain a competitive edge. In the quest to foster innovative, homegrown space companies, the expert highlights the need for a robust infrastructure capable of overcoming challenges and setbacks. Welcome back. For more news, let's take care of the world in a minute. At least a dozen people were killed and an unspecified number were left injured after a stampede at a soccer stadium in El Salvador over the weekend. As a result, the Salvadoran Football Federation has suspended the tournament. Ukraine's state-owned power generating company Energiatom has stated that there was a power outage at the Zaporizhia nuclear plant after Russia installed officials said the plant has switched to standby and emergency power supply. The time-lapse video showed ash and smoke erupting from Mexico's Popo Catapetal volcano. Puebla City in central Mexico was covered by the thick volcanic ash clouds. Popo Catapetal, one of the country's most active volcanoes, has recently intensified in its fiery activity. A SpaceX rocket ship lifted off carrying the second all-private astronaut team headed to the International Space Station. The Falcon 9 and Dragon capsule departed from the Kennedy Space Station in Cape Canaveral, Florida, transporting the crew members of Axiom Mission 2 for a week-long stay at the ISS. Tens of thousands of Moldovans rallied in the capital Chisinau to support their pro-Western government's drive towards Europe amid what officials have said are Russian affairs to destabilize their country. Moldova has been badly hit by the impact of Moscow's invasion of neighboring Ukraine, which Chisinau has repeatedly condemned and applied to join the European Union. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We finish off tonight's broadcast with Team Malizia overcoming a quick start by the 11th hour racing to win the in-port race as leg 5 of the Ocean Race. Thank you and have a good night.